welcome to Hack the Real Sides podcast with Heather, Ashley, and myself, Kira, where we like to delve into the personal journeys of people in the entertainment industry with a little bit of cheeky banter. And today we're going slightly off curve for us. So we are interviewing Jay Lane. So Jay is a San Francisco based drummer. He was a founding member of Bob Weir's Rat Dog, and he's also played in Primus and Charlie Hunter Trio. So we he has literally been in so many bands it is ridiculous so I'm not going to list them all but he has a plethora of music industry knowledge so this is going to be really interesting for those listeners of ours who are in the music industry because we usually just focus on the acting side of it or directing so this is a rare treat for us so we will probably not be uh, we probably won't be as on the ball with uh, our questioning as we would be yeah no, for the acting sure. side yeah. of it because we don't really know much about music but uh, thank you very much in advance for being patient with us yeah yeah it's uh you know the thing is it's changed everything's changed too so i'm sure a lot of the experiences and advice that i try to throw out there people are like well, what are you even talking about <laughs> yeah but that's good though it's nice i think sometimes the old school advice can still ring true even oh yeah yeah no everything's retro again <laughs> it does I'm a full set. Start calling myself retro yes i'm retro thank you we are retro. It's good. It's fine. So the way this works is I will just do like some quick fire questions for you just to get to know you a little bit better. Just some silly questions. Don't worry too much about the answers. Just throw them back at me. Right. And then Ashley will take the middle section where we talk about a little bit how you got started, what your process was. And Heather will talk about a bit more specific things about the music industry and preparing for maybe tours or how you learn things or I don't really know what she's going to ask. Cool. <laughs> Are you ready to start? Yep. Okay, so we will start nice and simple. Music related. Is there a particular song that will sort of get you on the dance floor or get you beaten in a in a club or something or at the bar or what's your go-to for good okay, vibes? My go-to would be anything by George Clinton or Prince. Oh, okay. So talking, talking about getting you right on the dance floor, like right on the dance floor. Yes. Yeah, maybe talking heads. Uh -huh. Anything 80s, 80s. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's stuff that's a lot to choose from. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. If you could be any fictional character, who would you choose? Oh, let's see. Fictional, let's see. I would choose probably Luke Skywalker. I don't know. <sighs> yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, who is the most interesting person you've ever met? And I expect there's probably a lot to choose from here. Um, I would have to say probably uh, the most interesting would have to be Johnny Johnson, who is the father of rock and roll. Uh, if you heard of a song called Johnny Be Good, yeah, oh, yeah. That, that, that was written about him uh, by Chuck Berry, who joined his band. Um, yeah, uh, the, probably the most interesting man I, I've ever met. Yeah. Wow, where did you meet him? Uh, we he he actually was in Rat Dog for a brief period in 1996. Um, uh, uh, Keith, uh, was, uh, Keith, Keith Richards and Eric Clapton put out a movie called Hail, Hail Rock and Roll about Chuck Berry and whatnot about 90, 1996 uh, to bring light to Chuck Berry and you know his creation of rock and roll and all that. And during the movie, they, they kind of uh, uncovered and dug out his, his original bandmates who was uh, the, uh, Johnny Johnson was uh, the, the the piano player that hired Chuck Berry when he was a kid, and then the rest was history. <clears throat> so, but Johnny was driving buses uh, for like old folks in, in St. Louis in the '80s, and and then they made that movie about him, or even in the '90s, they made that movie about him, and, and it brought a lot of light to him. And then Bob Weir, who I've been playing with since '94, a few years even before that, said, "Hey, let's get him in our band." And I'm like, okay, so. Uh, so uh, every day was my my duty to pick him up and bring him to rehearsal. So I got this like per personal like one on one time with like the father of rock and roll. Basically every day it was kind of awesome. And before that, he was driving buses. Yeah, you know because uh, you know because everybody screwed each other other over in the in the music. You know that's what music's all about screwing over the next guy. You know it is it really is. And and uh, 
So even the most screwed over guys were screwing over their guys. <laughs> you know, like Chuck Berry got screwed over, but then he was screwing over his guys. Anyway, all those statue of limitations run out on that stuff after a year, so you can't really come around and claim any songwriting, even though you may have been there at the creation of rock and roll. But so anyway, so I think Bob and them were like, well, let's let's get him in our band. Let's, so so we were lucky enough to have him come play uh, Grateful, Dead, Grateful Dead songs and blues songs with us. Oh, wow. That must have been amazing. 1996, yep. Wow. Yep. Uh, what's the longest drum solo you've ever done? Oh, too long. Whatever it was, it was just too long. I do not <laughs> like drum solos. They're so embarrassing. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Okay. It just sounds like... Uh, people don't really dance to that anyway, you know. No. Uh, so I'm a bad one to ask that question. But yeah. Are they used for filling time whilst the rest of the band go off and yeah. do something? It, or it, is it like, is there a purpose to them? It, it's a bathroom break. For sure. <laughs> so you've got to keep going until the slowest person to pee comes back on stage. Well, no, not for, I'm talking about for the audience. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I think you meant the band. I'm yeah. just going to play the drums whilst you guys go have a quick break. Yeah, yeah. No, it's for the audience, you know. Oh, this I, I know I'm not going to hear my favorite song for another 10 minutes while they do this drum solo. So let me go pee right now, you know. Oh. <laughs> I feel like I feel like uh college Ashley would argue with you on that because I had my little moments of dancing to, you know, guitar and drum solos. Oh, that's cool. Well, you yeah. got an open mind there. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, a lot of people just want to hear their favorite song, man. Where's my song? <laughs> What is this? Uh, but 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 um or whatever. Okay, all right, come on, get out of here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I you know, I, of course, drum solos were uh, not drum solos, but tricky, fancy, complicated sounding drumming is what made me want to get into drumming f from the beginning. Anyway, so it's hard to argue against drum solos, I guess. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I've learned to play really simple to to keep to keep a gig, you know. That's pretty cool. That's very insightful. Uh, what do you think is the best smell in the world? Uh, jasmine. Jasmine? Oh, you rosemary. need that straight away. A rosemary is good too. Yeah? Nice. Oh, okay. Rosemary then. What's your biggest kitchen fail? Uh, like every day. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, I can't make anything in the kitchen really. Uh, my biggest kitchen fail is trying to cook two or three things at once, you know, get the timing right. I can't do that. <laughs> I once made um, a chili, uh, like a, a mince dish, and somehow it, it ended up tasting like Christmas pudding. Because oh. I put brown sauce over over in the UK, we have something called brown sauce. I don't know what your equivalent would be. And you can have it on like bacon sandwiches, and things like that. And for some reason, I put an awful lot into this uh, mince dish. And yeah, the, it was weird. It tastes like Christmas pudding. Very strange. Not my best cooking moment, I have to say. Um, and then we have two questions we like to ask all of our guests because we just love the answers. If you could remake any, we usually say any film using just the cast of The Muppets, but we could say if you want to remake any music video using just the cast of The Muppets uh, and one human character, what film or what uh, music video would it be? Oh, let's see. Uh, I guess if obviously the Robert Palmer one with the dance, you know, the girls dancing with the back. <laughs> Addicted to love, right? That yes. one. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that is brilliant. That is, that's actually genius. I, I, they must have it. done that. I know they must have done it. Everybody's done that one. I don't think the Muppets have done that. that I will be YouTubing that later to see if it's yeah. been done, but that is actually brilliant and um the other one we ask is realistically how long do you think you'd survive in a zombie apocalypse do you have any skills you're bringing to the table are you dying uh, on day one uh yeah no I, I would survive for a little while but i i think about it every now and then i watched the walking dead i was like you know what after a while i'd just be like okay i'll join the party <laughs> and get it over with you know you're gonna sacrifice yeah yeah, you have to be careful how you join the party because, in some ways, like you're not joining the party; you're just done. Your food. Yeah. No, yeah, totally. But but you know, I mean, like you know, it's like the, the the zombies never stop coming. So at least you could just be one of them. I don't know. Thank you so much for uh, joining in my ridiculous part. I shall pass you along to Ashley for slightly more serious questions. 
and I know you've kind of touched base on it, but I like to kind of start off like where you grew up and then kind of how did that evolve into your passion for music? Well, so uh, I have to bring up the fact that my uh, mother um, was kind enough to realize that I needed something to do. So she, you know, when I was uh, nine years old, she she recognized the restless kid in me and, and took me around to try to find some sort of musical lessons that I uh, would, <clears throat> would, you know, kind of like to do. And she gave me a couple of choices. We went to like a piano school. I think there was, uh, there was a couple group classes, things, you know. And then we finally ended up at this guy's studio who, who had like a, a rock and roll kind of, you know, music studio, carpets on the walls, totally 70s, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and he had a drum set and I was like, oh, I want to do this. So, so I was nine years old, um, and uh, and then you know the fact that I had taken a few drum lessons, even though I kind of stopped practicing, then she you know they stopped paying for the lessons, but I had the drum set in my room. So then when I approached you know being you know the start to be social age, you know like twelve, thirteen, fourteen years old, you're hanging out with your buddies. Hey, what do you do? Oh, I play the drums. Oh, I play the guitar. Hey, let's jam. And that's how that, that's all, the, all that starts, junior high school, you know. So it's really, it's really the parents that, that, that give you the opportunity, you know. There was also a music, uh, summer music camp that my mom sent me to that um, where a lot of kids who didn't have the uh, opportunity to have the private lessons were in a community, co commun co communal-based uh, summer camp run by the city of Berkeley, of all places, um, up in the Redwoods. And uh, it, uh, it was called Casadero Music Camp, and there was like, so it was like the local jazz musicians, all the, all the local greats were like the counselors and teaching us kids and buying us beers and getting us high and stuff. And, and then they would, you know, the, the kids would tell the parents, and then the, the, the camp would almost get shut down every year. But, but anyway, um, uh, <clears throat> but there was Whoopi Goldberg was up there before she made it. Uh, Bobby McFerrin, you know, don't worry, be happy. He was up there before he made it. These are all before they made it. You know, they were just like local pillars of the, uh, of the, you know, uh, entertainment scene in the Bay Area. And um, uh, yeah, it was before Whoopi even did her mom's Mabley thing. Uh, yeah, she had the, a husband named David Goldberg, who's, who's really funny. Who's, uh, they were like a comedy team or something. Um, but it was that, and then, and then, you know, and then after junior high school, you're in high school, and you're meeting more kids, and then I joined a band out of high school. Let me know if I'm taking too long this answer. No, these are great. So then there was a band that was playing all ages shows in Berkeley. I grew up in San Francisco across the bay, and so there was a band of 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 high school kids who were playing all ages shows, and all their friends in high school classmates would come to their show so they were like successful right away there was a ska band called the uptones um there was a big ska thing in the early 80s uh in the bay area and and they had a, a little bit of success uh had a song on the radio a couple songs on the radio um and uh this was pre that uh gilman street scene that sprouted green day it was kind of the same same thing but like 10 years earlier um <clears throat> and um, the uptones were, you know, this like a uh, the kids weren't they were all in high school and they were all going off to college and do their thing. It was just it's something they did. It's fun. Nobody was really quitting their life to be in a band. I joined the band because the drummer went off to college. The kids were slowly peeling off, going to college. So the other kids were joining. I joined that band. I had no ambition to go to college or for real college or anything. And, I did go to a couple months at a music college in Boston after that. But, but the thing is, is I had, oh no, before that, I came back and joined that band and that's why I didn't go back to college. And then, um, and then I joined another band that was gigging also in the Bay area called the freaky executives, like eight piece funk band, like a uh, picture Bruno Mars, but you know, 35, 40 years ago. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we wore trench coats and did steps and, uh, it was a, it was a multiracial band, and I'm not sure if if uh, you know we were a little too you know sometimes you know they they, they want to 
pig? Is it a black band or is it a white band? What is this? How do I market this? And it's like, well, it's about equally half white guys, half black guys. They didn't know what the hell to do with this. And so uh, that thing kind of ran its course. At the end of that, I started playing. There was a big rehearsal uh, warehouse that that a bunch of bands rehearsed in in the East Bay. And I started playing with this guy, Les Claypool, in a band called Primus. And uh, I quit that to, to stay in the free. He wanted to take that on the road. I, I, I wasn't down with that. I wanted to f finish out my tenure with the Freaky Executives. Long story short, Primus makes big time. And he I don't know if you know Primus. You guys are a little young for that even. it's uh, He did the music for South Park. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going down South Park. Man, man. That's, that's him. Um, so... Uh, so anyway, uh, I was in one band that made it. They made it after I was in them, but through that my association with them, I got other connections that like got me to Bob, play with Bob Weir. That was like 1994. I started playing with Bob Weir, and I'm still playing with them today. Mm -hmm. uh, the band now is called Wolf Bros. Um, but yeah, I uh, got to play with John Mayer. You guys know who that is, right? Yeah. He, he's in the the Dead and Co with with Bob Weir and the other Dead guys, and uh, but he came and sat us in with us uh, a couple weeks ago at Radio City Music Hall, um, and yeah, so it's you know I I think to answer your question the, the, what it was is I did so much of it I played so much music with so many people there was one that hit mm -hmm. and that's how I got my connection. So, so with you playing with all these different bands um, and you said you were in the band that they didn't kind of know where to put you in your genre, yeah. how, like who inspired you um, with your music? Like, what would you say your biggest inspirations are? Well, I used to like jazz. Uh, well, I, when I grew up, I mean, you know, I, I so here's the other thing. It's, it's very interesting. I was talking with my daughter about this because she's like, dad, why don't you show me this music? Show me that music. I'm like, man, just go figure it out on your own. Man, to tell you guys to figure it out on your own nowadays with the damn internet and like the damn, like you have every last thing from all time at your mm -hmm. fingertips and you're isolated. So it's almost like there's no way to navigate the good from the bad. This is probably what I want to express most in this podcast is how nowadays do you navigate what's good from what's bad? Like, for instance, when I was a kid, you know, I went to the record store with, you know, you had enough to buy one record you didn't buy the whole record store you bought one record so usually you picked out some a cool picture or something you didn't know what there was on the music in fact a lot of people buying the grateful dead stuff used to think it was like heavy metal because all the sk skulls and all the stuff they're like what the hell is this man yeah <laughs> it was all soft you know but anyway uh like i so i i got into like uh Funkadelic, you know, George Clinton in Parliament. And then I got into a band called Weather Report that was 70s kind of jazz fusion. I was really into that. And that's where I really got into playing drums with all the guys who were playing all fancy and busy and all that stuff and that music. Before that fell into a category of elevator music around 1979. Um, and uh, so so you had, you had record stores, you bought one or two records, right? You had your favorite couple of bands. And then you listen to the radio and you're watching TV. Maybe you had a VCR tape later on. But what you did have was you had friends going, nah, dude, that sucks. Listen to this. And then you're like, oh, yeah, this is what everybody's listening to. Yeah, cool. Oh, yeah, that's the stuff I was listening to kind of sucks. Yeah, he, he's right, you know. So some, sometimes, like, without friends or somebody to bounce something off, you can't really tell if you're – waiting in the mud or if you're like on to the next thing oh yeah man because you know sometimes it does take a hive mentality i'll give you an example somewhere between 1985 and 1987 everybody starts rapping i'm like what the hell is this everybody's rapping oh everybody's freestyling rap rapidy rap, rap like people that don't even know each other are like all of a sudden rapping i'm like is this like a hive mentality it sort of is like Things like that do happen, like where it's like, what the hell was this was rapping out of this right now? Is everybody's about rapping and stuff? It's like it was a thing, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, these things just become things, and and I, 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 it's like we are a giant hive in a way, you know. So it's so now it's 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 so hard to navigate stuff, because like for instance, nowadays I'll do a gig with somebody, it'll be like, oh, I'll send you the song list, learn these songs. So you got to go on YouTube and like check it out, check that stuff out. But I mean, just it just seems so much to wade through the internet to try to find the good stuff from the bad. And then 
And then you might even be looking for something with a video instead of just the audio. Maybe the audio is really the stuff. And then there's stuff that never even made it to the internet. You know, I know some stuff that, that rec some records I had that I never saw on the internet, you know. I'll give you an example. You know, you know that Dr. Dre Snoop Dogg music, right? You know that those kind of beats? They always had that little worm sound in there. They go, meow. You know, all those that West Coast uh, mm -hmm. kind of rap always had that little worm sound. It's like a thing. They call it the lead line or whatever. The little kind of wormy sound up, up top, you know. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that started from a sample from a guy named Walter Junie Morrison, who uh, who used to be an Ohio player. He played a song, wrote a song called "The Funky Worm" when he was 18 years old. He also wrote "Knee Deep" and uh, and "One Nation Under a Groove" for for Parliament. Funkadelic years later, but nobody knows who the guy is. Like barely anybody knows who that guy is, you know. And uh, anyway, so those are the guys I like to champion. You know, those are those are my favorite guys. You know, guys that like people don't really know who they are, but they were just part of a group. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I know I'm getting off the subject here, but yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean you gave us a, a view on something that's not really thought thought about or a lot. I feel like because sampling music, I mean. I feel like as you get older, you're like, there's a new song comes out and they sample a part of a song, you know, and we know what the original is or whatnot, or actually not the original. It probably comes from some other band. So I think that's something that a lot of people aren't, don't really know that parts of music that, like you said, the West Coast rap songs and things like that have something that came from someone else, you know, they're yeah. originally from that person and to know that story, you know, so yeah, so it's it's, it's it's good it's good to know those stories, you know, like yeah. like like the guy who drew the mouse for Walt Disney, he got mm -hmm. totally screwed over. If you look him up, mm -hmm. really weird story. It was like Disney started out; it was two of them. They were partners, <laughs> and the one guy did all the the, the drawing, and the other guy did did all the schmoozing. And he, you know, the guy who did the drawing was so, got got kind of out there because all that drawing is so meticulous, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, he just kind of fell by the wayside, you know, and, and it's kind of a sad story. But would, Disney would have been nothing without. It's, it's funny to hear these stories about these famous guys who would have been nothing without their team, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at my questions over here because you've answered a lot of things. So I, I guess. One of our questions that we'd like to ask that you do not have to answer if you don't want to, we'd like to say, ask what your greatest success has been or your harshest, harshest experience has been so far. Oh, I've got a good one, yeah. Greatest success, playing for thousands of hippies, right? I mean, those I played for thousands of hippies, man, like tens of thousands at one time. They're like, oh, wow, look at this giant concert. Wow, it's cool. Probably greatest success was actually with when Johnny Johnson was in the band in 96, we played Bill Clinton's inauguration. And that was cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to shake Bill Clinton's hand, Al Gore's hand. So I, I'd have to say that was probably my, my, my highest moment. Um, actually, on this tour that we just played, somebody worked it out. So Ron Carter came and sat in. He's like the father of modern jazz bass. Uh, played with Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock in the 60s. Mm -hmm. The most famous jazz b bass player of all time somehow came to our gig and played with me. And it was like, uh, I was nervous as shit. So that was, that was, a, that was a big one. I'd say my, my worst humiliating moment, something that you couldn't even have a bad dream about, was uh, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, there was a Bay Area Music Awards in the uh, year 2002, and I actually won Drummer of the Year. I was like, you know, whatever, you know, it's a, an award. And so, but, you know, it makes you feel good, whatever. And then at the end of the night, there was a big jam with all the celebrities, you know. And that dude from Smash Mouth was, was singing. It was that band Smash Mouth, and they were playing their song or whatever. And I knew the drummer, and he was like, hey, you want to sit in? I was like, all right, whatever. He goes, no, come on, dude, I'll give you the look. And when I give you the look, come on over. I'll give you the sticks and just start playing. So he gives me the look. I go over there, start 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 playing, and that mother I, that, that lead singer <laughs> stops to say stop, stop stop stops the song, turns around and goes, "Hey, I love you, bro, but uh, Michael, sit back down. Let's finish that song." I was like, it was so humiliating, you know. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't think that dude's too popular anyway. But uh, 
um, uh, my my sister in law and her husband at the time went went charging right after him. They they were not having it. She was not having watching me get humiliated like that on stage. Wow. But it's like it's almost like the Will Smith Chris Rock thing. It wasn't what it wasn't as bad. But what do you do in that moment? Like I, I was thinking afterwards. Oh man, I should have stood up and said, man, I could have made a. Whatever. But it's like, no, show must go on. Show must go on. Whatever, whatever. It's not about me. Show must go on. <laughs> you know? That is crazy so. that he did that. Sorry. Yeah, what a prick. I Sorry. mean, what a great guy, huh? <laughs> I just, I don't know. I just always wonder what the person that does those kind of actions, you know, you've got Kanye West when he went up, you know, when Taylor won her award and like, like Beyonce's the, you know, the better singer or whatever. Okay. Um, now here's uh, here's another I'll, I'll I'll flip something on you. I had an I had a similar experience where I was Will Smith. So what happened was that was a little different. Mm -hmm. My wife was we we had our 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 my twenty eight my twenty eight year old daughter was two years old and we were at the it was in nineteen ninety six and we it was my first big hometown show with Rat Dog at the Shoreline Amphitheater huge big deal right. Anyway, you know, it's also the year after Jerry died and, and the Grateful Dead ended and a lot of hippies were sad. And for me, it was the most exciting new thing. For a lot of these people, it was like the end of their whole thing, mm -hmm. especially the, the stage wranglers, the guys, the, the stage bullies that like to push around all the hippies that try to crowd, glom on the stage. And the, these guys have been for 30 years been going, you get off the stage. You can't be there. You can't be there. These guys... My uh, the dude actually pushed my wife, and and and, and then she, then she she was really upset. Fifteen minutes before I was about to go on stage, so like Will Smith was just about to win his big award. He knew he was about to win that award. It's his biggest moment, so your adrenaline is up here, mm -hmm. and all you need is that little thing to push you. Somebody pushed my. In in my case. He actually pushed my wife. He put his hands on my wife when she's holding her two-year-old daughter, right? Mm -hmm. Not cool. I stormed up, tore a curtain down, stormed right through this backdrop, went right up to him, and I was yelling at him all this profanity. I never touched him, though, but I yelled at him and made it pretty pretty clear in front of the whole audience. If any, you know, it was between bands. Like, if anybody had noticed, hey, what's going on up there? Uh, but I, was, I didn't care. I was right in front of the stage yelling at him. Uh, but I didn't touch him, but I understand that rage at, at your highest moment when you're about to, your adrenaline's already, already like super high because mm -hmm. you were going to have your great moment. And then maybe that feeling like somebody's going to mess it up for you, you know, yeah. like you're, you're going to mess up my good moment. No, you're not. But anyway, I didn't put my hands on anybody. That's, that's, that's crossing the line. It's you always, you want to use your words, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, anyway. I agree. Um, well, I'm going to pass you on to Heather so she can get more into how you like prep and, um, her questions. Oh, great. This, you know what, this interview is a lot better than some of these so-called professional interviews that I'm supposed to do. Um, some of these guys have the, like the worst questions, you know, it's like, you guys, you guys are, this is great. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I think it's because when we do, when we started this podcast, like it was, we really wanted to you know, know the stories behind people who are in the entertainment industry, you know, mm -hmm. and like how they got to where they were and their inspirations because it's all that backstory and, and yeah. everybody's path is different. And some people make it when they're young. Some people don't start till they're older and then they make it. Some people go into oh, it and then they, they pull away and then they go back into it. And so we yeah. like to just yeah, know the person. Yeah, that's, and that's beautiful too, because there's a lot of stuff like, well, if you didn't do it by this age, you might as well give it up. Right. You know? exactly. That's not, that's not that's true, funny. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see like when old people make it for the first time. Or I know. Like, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, I know. That's how we yeah. feel. Like three geriatric women here. <laughs> Trying to make it. You know, obviously, obviously the, the, you know, the old, the old rules are true. Like, you know, you got to show up on time. You got to show up with a good attitude. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, I know a lot of musicians, you know, I'll just put it out there. The most talented people I know did not make it. The most talented people mm -hmm. I know. And the people I know that made it are some of the last people I ever thought would have made it. But just because they had a great attitude and they showed up on time, mm -hmm. you know, that right time and right place too. But yeah, it could be luck. Yeah. But yeah. persistence, you know. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. You had mentioned before that you had an opportunity to go on tour and you did not go because you needed to finish up your, um, well, no, I, yeah. So I, 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 it, it was like, I was in, let's, let's put it this way. I was in this band called the freaky executives. Mm-hmm. We had a big rec- Warner brothers recording contract. Mm-hmm. We were like big, big, we were like the big fish in, in the small pond here in the Bay area. And then this bit, little band Primus was kind of this, like this little band that I didn't, it was kind of quirky and I didn't really see them making it. And I just played with them because our, we had already kind of crested and we were kind of, I could tell, you know, the band had kind of had its peak and we were kind of cresting down. So I started playing with this other band, not knowing that, you know, there was going to be this whole change in about 1990, like all the, all the black guys, fucking every, all the white guys and black guys, everybody cut their hair. It's like all the hair bands, all the hair from the 80s got cut. Year 1990, literally, boom. And then it was like Nirvana and all that shit was cool. You know, and uh, um, it's lit- it's amazing how the styles changed overnight, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, and all of a sudden, this little band that I didn't think was going to be cool was all of a sudden cool. This band Primus, you know. And, and uh, <clears throat> but But at the time, when I made the decision... I, I made the decision to stay with the band that I had already put a lot of time and effort, blood, sweat, and tears into, and I thought I was, a, you know, more of an executive member, of songwriting partner, and all that, you know. Um, and I didn't really see, I didn't see the other band really making it. And I, I will even add that had I stayed in that band, they, there's a chance that they might have not made it, because the other drummer had a different, he had a heavy metal style. I was more mm-hmm. funk. And jazz, he had heavy metal, and that put him in that category. So mm-hmm. they were able to go on the Horde tour. They kind of Oz Eve, Oz Fest, and all that. that's how they kind of did their thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but yeah, um, so I had the opportunity. But yeah. So which uh, when did you start going on tour, and how did you prepare for? Because so, when you go on tour, it's for a long period of time. Yeah. So so basically, I only did little jaunts up and down the coast. Santa Cruz, maybe L.A., <clears throat> Santa Rosa, Chico, just local stuff. Uh, Portland, Seattle. Not, I didn't. I didn't head out east at all until I got the gig with Bob Weir. Well, actually, no. Uh, uh, with the Primus guys, we did a thing called Sausage. We opened up for Henry Rollins Band and Helmet uh, in 1994, and that was a tour. That was my first big tour, going on there on a bus. And then, uh, but then the gig with Bob Weir, which pretty much happened around the same time, um, it was just just so exciting the idea of being on a bus and and, and going and playing gigs every night and staying in hotels. I didn't. I it's like even though I didn't know the Grateful Dead music at all, I was like, whatever. I just want to be. I don't. I just want to live that life. I don't care what it takes. You know. Uh, lucky. L- luckily for me, <clears throat> you know, a lot of bands have to start out in little cars and vans and sleeping on floors and, and, and like kind of the not so, you know, not so luxurious uh, conditions starting out on tour. I was lucky enough to, I only did that in the eighties, but never really long drives. You know, I think also living on the West coast touring is, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a regional thing. So if like, if you're on the West coast, you're not doing much touring except for up, to, up and down the coast. Everything else is eight, 10 hours, you know, and then it's another eight, 10 hours to Denver or whatever. So, but if you're in Denver, there's a bunch of stuff around there. I'd like, you know, as you get more east, you get more bands that were touring even on a lower level because it's not that far to go to the next town. And uh, yeah, and even the Grateful Dead apparently was bigger out on the East Coast, even though they were from the West Coast. But um, yeah, that has a lot to do with it is how far those drives are. But but I was very fortunate, and I I did I whatever it took to I to to do that, and uh, of course I got married at the same time. My wife was my good luck charm because I really wasn't gigging at all or working until she came in the picture, and then uh, so it's it had been it's it it we we got used to it, but you know it it was it's rough to leave like for three months out of the year. Seems you know, like it's one month in the spring, one month in the summer, and one month in the fall. Roughly is what most bands do, mm-hmm. w- whether it's longer or shorter. Those are the the, the big tour uh, times, and um, yeah, we just got used to it over the years. Uh, <clears throat> me being gone for that amount of time, I left 
on tour when my daughter was two weeks old. I came back when she was six weeks old. That was that was the toughest. Mm -hmm. I'd have to say that, that yeah. was the toughest thing. That would be tough. That would be difficult. Um, so do you have any like routines or rituals that you do before you go on stage just to calm the nerves? Yeah, actually we, uh, well, over the years I've, I've done all sorts of drugs and all the whatnot, you know, but, um, I'd say I used to get really nervous, you know, and that's why people do drugs or drink or whatever it is to try to mm -hmm. cut that edge of that nervousness. Um, I, <clears throat> I had to do a couple things. I had to start not, I had to realize instead of this, you're playing in front of a bunch of judge and jury out there judging how good you are. Once I actually went out there and hung out with them or like played, you know, we're playing at a smaller bar. They were like, oh, they're just, they're just, they're just all drunk. Like they don't, they don't care. There's here, they're, they love it. They, they, they don't, they don't notice when you mess up. I mean, because when you go talk to them, it's like, oh, yeah, man, these guys, don't, they, they're not going to notice the damn thing. They just want to hear that damn song again and again. They just want to dance and dance and dance. And it's like, and then so I tried to start thinking about how does a DJ, well, I bet DJs don't get nervous, right? They, there's, they're not performing. They're just supplying the party music. And that's how these 60s bands really started out. There was a light show of those little bloop, bloop, bloop kind of, uh, you know, those 60s light shows where it's like looked like a big oil blotter thing or whatever that was all about going to that and taking ass and going and seeing that the band was in the dark so those bands i think a lot of those bands rolling stones grateful dead jefferson airplane they got their start with it not really being about them so i think they were able to probably create and 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 and, and do a lot of stuff without worrying about oh they like us oh they want oh they're looking at us oh you know, because that's what makes you nervous, you know, is, is that, that that they're looking and judging. So that's, that is the beautiful thing about the Grateful Dead scene is that they're, they're really loose and, and you know. But, um, <clears throat> but other rituals, uh, recently we started doing a little TM, a little transcendental meditation, which, re which really helps. And it was actually pretty scary the first time you like sit there with your eyes closed and all this crazy thoughts going through your head, you know, it's like, we're always filling up our time with talking or watching things and this constant eye, ear, candy constantly all day long. So to actually sit in the dark and with your thoughts for like 20 minutes is, is totally frightening. But it's really great before you go on stage. Like it just, especially at a big show, it's just like mellows you out. You're almost ready for a nap. And then you get on stage like, okay. Um, you know. And you got that um, adrenaline rush. But, you know, I, I won't say anything other about drugs other than one thing Garcia said. I, I, what, people asked him, Jerry Garcia, why, why do you take drugs? Or what was the deal with the taking the drugs on the stage? And he had an interesting point he made that um, sometimes you just got to get past yourself. You know what I mean? You just, you're here to make the music. You're here to make it sound good. But sometimes you just can't get past yourself. And... Well, sometimes, like, if, if you're flying by the seat of your pants on shrooms or something, you're like, you ain't got time to worry about yourself. You're like, oh, my God, let me let me listen and play as best as I can. That's that's really what you're trying to do is you're listening and playing, which is two very hard things to do. I'm sure, like, in acting, like, how do you put it out there and receive it at the same time? Like, literally at the same time, it's, it's, it's really hard and challenging. So the more you can get... The more you can get past yourself, I think, uh, you know what I mean? Just get past your ego, get past if you, you're messing up anything or, or what anybody thinks about you or, or what anybody's going to think about the, the result of the show or if you guys play good or not, you know, because sometimes, you know, like I would, I would like listen, you know, sometimes I would like, so here's a good example. We would tour around a lot of times. We go to Chattanooga, Tennessee. We go to Syracuse, New York, places where you know, you know, you don't even care. You know, uh, Birmingham, Alabama is like they're just so glad you came. You know, yeah. L.A. and New York and Chicago. Oh my God, you better play good tonight. Oh, you know who's going to be watching it tonight? So I always had this thing about you got to play good in those towns, and I, I always felt like I blew it in those towns. 
And then I had one one time I finally felt like I killed it in New York. I was like, oh, man, I killed it tonight. And it didn't make any difference. They were still on to the next day after the show. Nobody came and told you how much how much it meant to you. You know what I mean? It's just <laughs> that, that kind of put everything in its place. You know, it's like, oh, I see. Yeah, these big big city folks, they've seen it all and done all that. You know, whatever. Let them, let them you know, let them have their little thing or whatever but but so so that's another thing i i would prep for is trying to to treat every show as if it's just like we're playing just for you know a couple people down there's only 10 people watching it there's glad you came yeah you know? that's good advice that's very good advice <laughs> because um, like they, they always say like try to picture the audience in their underwear it's kind of like doing that yeah you know? Like that doesn't really, you can't really picture the audience in their underwear. That, but the, that metaphorically, that what that means is this: it's they're they're not a big deal out there, you know. They're just you know, even if there's a lot of them, you know, they can become a mob. But yeah, yeah, it's funny. So, what do you feel up to this point has shaped your career the most? Where you're at today? Huh. Um, I just, I would say just going, going along with it. See, the thing is, I haven't done too much proactively. Like I, I should be parlaying my, my situation way better. It's like, oh man, look right now, like I'm playing on this level with these cats. I should be putting out my own thing. You know, it's like a lot of people think that way. Um, and, uh, and I, I don't. Wait, what was the question again? Just what what have you worked on that you feel like has really just kind of shaped your career into where you're at today? Yeah, I, I think just going along with these things, just like being reliable, mm -hmm. you know. Um, sometimes you see, when you, I tell my daughter this, you know, it's like well, when you get out there, you're going to see yourself. You're going to see another you. You're going to see that competition. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you're all unique and individual but wait till you show up at the cattle call and there's 20 exactly like you and you see somebody that's like got everything you got except better how do you find your something that you do that they don't do you know what i mean so maybe maybe it's like you know like and and sometimes you really do have to go there in your mind well i bet they can't draw as good as me i could draw better you know, or something like that it has nothing to do with it. You know, well, I'm more reliable. How about that? I la I'm easier. I laugh at people's jokes louder than you laugh at people's jokes. You know, or it's like, like you know, I like because I know a lot of uh, where I've gotten to is because I'm a good hang. Like for for the two important employers of my life who've become my very good friends, Les Claypool and Bob Weir, I'm like, you know, I I I'm a good hang. You know, for all the people that probably make them nervous with their celebrity and all that, I'm the guy that like makes them laugh and stuff. You know, so that, that, yeah, yeah that, that that's that's important because because there oh there's a lot of people that that like you know are like really worried about like you know what people think about them or if they're doing the right thing and people are watching there, especially the more important people you, you get around. All of a sudden, there's these people that are really like watching their back and it's like whoa man it's just not the mellow little thing it used to be you know it's just all now now it's all important so so the more you can just like uh i guess realize why you're there sometimes you have to realize why you're there you know it's like wait why am i here am i here for the accolades am i here to be up on stage for all these people or am i here for the music you know because all the rest of it can drive you crazy like like for instance if you're on a gig with somebody you were on the gig longer and now they're making more money than you or little weird stuff like that can get you very envious sometimes and jealous. Mm -hmm. These feelings can come out and you really have to have somewhere else you could, it's like, okay, it's not going to change because I feel that way. I'm, it's not going to get me more money right now, but let, you know, let me just try to focus on what it is I have that maybe some of these people don't have. Mm-hmm. And maybe it is just being stupid, you know, like the text threads, everybody's text threads, their big text threads, like, oh yeah, what do you, th the boss says an idea and everybody's like, oh, great idea. Oh, I love that idea. And I, I'm like, send a picture all like, hey, hey, you know, it's like, or, you know what I mean? Sometimes you got to be that guy just to break the ice and, you know, yeah. not make, let the boss know not everybody kissing his ass, 
<laughs> I mean, really, like, because there's always going to be a boss, and no matter what situation you're in, there's going to be some boss, and those some people are going to be right up his ass or her ass. You, you've seen it all, right? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, one question we really wanted to ask, because the music industry has changed so much over even just the last five to ten years, is the streaming. It's like we're now in that streaming era, and do you feel like it has been beneficial to artists to have to be in the streaming era right now i don't know because because uh because like you know when when you're when you're scrolling the stuff that gets the, whoever's really on top of their social media presence gets pushed right in your face mm -hmm. and then you know and then somebody could be trying equally as hard and they just don't know how they don't have all the tricks and tips and maybe they're not paying for this or that ad space and Mm -hmm. and they're just not getting it and it's I, I i'm not sure i'm not sure where i stand on it because it, it you know even though there's so much more to navigate there um back in the day you know i mean i got screwed over back then too it's like i'm not i'm not sure if i'm getting any more screwed over now than i ever than i did back then you know what i mean mm -hmm. um with the record companies taking everything you know now it's the streaming platforms that are taking everything the spotify guys are like rich and gosh, the, you know, the one thing that would just, just gets up my craw, though, is that you would think that you could, would be able to, whatever music you're listening to, there would be a picture, like, you know, there's a picture of the album cover. You would think you could click on it and look at the back of the album cover. And then each name of each person that did every, anything involved with that recording had their name highlighted and you could click on a link to see the, the, that about that person. I cannot believe they don't have that nowadays. You know, I mean, that's just, uh, this is unfathomable because that's, you know, that'd be the one thing that would be like, well, that's cool. You know, because that's, that's the one thing you did, what, you know, back in the day is like, you, you, you liked the record. So you're sitting there listening to the record, looking at all the things on the back of the album and you're, you know, all them, all those names are getting ingrained in your head. So the next time you go, it's like, Oh, that was the guy that played on, or that was the person played on that album. Oh, I want that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think I got off the subject. Yeah, it's well, it's kind of like the CD inserts, you know, when they went to CDs or even like the tapes, and you could pull out the inserts and you would unravel all of it. Well, the and you all that information, you know, and they the people know who, how hard it is nowadays. They can go on the internet, and someone's already done the lyrics for them. We had to sit there if we didn't have lyrics on the insert. We had to sit there and go over the right. I had used to have lyrics notepads where I would. Uh, and and then and then you might incorrectly for a long time, but right no that sometimes it's better incorrectly, right? I agree. Yeah, I agree too. You know, but I think Pandora. I don't know how popular that is, but I do think on their platform, if you click on the picture of the um, album, it will give you a different screen, oh, and cool. it, you can go get the lyrics, or you can look up people that. I don't know if it has everyone because I don't click it very often because I'm usually listening to it in my car. You know, that's but here. You can click and I think it does give you names of some people. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, I don't know how to work Spotify. So I just. Yeah. No, I you know what? That's, that's, that's cool. That's good to hear. In fact, uh, that band I was talking about, the Uptones, the ska band that I was in in 1984, uh, the guitar player from that band now, um, he works for uh, Pandora. And, and that was the first thing I said to him. He goes, oh, that's what I'm working on. And this was about a year or so ago. So maybe okay. maybe they did it. Maybe they did get that going. So that's pretty cool. Just, you you were that little spark to get him going. Maybe. maybe. I mean, he might have been already on that because, you know, he's my age. And, mm -hmm. and you know, he's, he, I'm sure he's, he's, he's aware of all that stuff. He's, he just started his little record company, too. But, um, yeah, the, you know, the pandemic has also been really tough on people. But, mm -hmm. but, you know, but trying to, like, nowadays, how would you – what would you take from my interview right now and try to be like, all right, what does that have to do with me right now? Good luck. That's a good luck. You good. You had all that luck, Jay. I'm glad stuff lined up for you, but what about me right now? How does this help me? You know? I think it's been really interesting actually, because one of the things I was thinking of was uh, when you were listing all the bands that you played in to start with, and I did this and I did that and I did this little group and I did that little group. One thing they don't tend to do in the, acting world is I mean we always say make your own material but actually when you're a musician you can literally get a group of people together go play in a dive bar and you are performing you are doing yeah. that and it doesn't really translate into the acting world that people don't go out and do just perform just perform just perform 
and try all these different areas and these different avenues and these different venues and then maybe one day they'll get it they they don't tend to do that they tend to audition for things or sometimes they make right. their own yeah stuff, their own yeah, thing, because, but... yeah because you know that's right and you know back when i was younger it, it was mostly groups like all the all the, the music it was like mostly groups now it's mostly like artists like single mm -hmm. artists you know everything's mm -hmm. they, you know they, they, they they've they've narrowed it down to trim all the fat you know trim all the fat you know zero so what is it now it's really so now music has become like where it's like one solo artist and then whoever who cares who's the band it's like that's the right music. it was always bands and now it's just the artists yeah. i didn't i I didn't really think about that, but when you were talking, I was like, yeah. "We did. We didn't now, really have that many solo." You, you know, you, you know what I have to say. I, I'm not going to blame him, but Prince was the first one who really made multi-tracking, recording everything by yourself, a real popular thing. Other people had done it, but more in the shadows. Like Paul McCartney played a lot of Beatles stuff, right? He played drums and bass on a lot of Beatles stuff. I mean, nobody knows. Right. There's a lot of people over the years who like, you know, maybe the drummer in the band couldn't get the right feel when they went in the studio. So the guitar player just played the drums because it was just supposed to be a dumb drum beat that maybe was too simple for the drummer to do. But Prince was the first one who made it known that he, he played all the instruments. So and, and he wasn't the first one to do it, like I said, but he was the first one who made it really popular. Mm -hmm. And so maybe ever since, you know, there's been this idea that all you need is that one super talent and uh, and then the rest is baggage. Because, like I said, like, you know, I, I you know, I was in these bands were the eight piece bands, six piece, eight piece bands where you, when you get the deal, it's just like, all right, let's trim the fat. Do you need do you need three horn players? No. Do you need two keyboard players? No. Do you, you know, but the thing is, like you said. When you get a band and you're going around, maybe not everybody's the leader. Like my daughter's like, oh, help me, man, help me do this. I'm like, try to be a backup player. But you would never know that unless you were with a group of people. Maybe you're like, hey, I like to be in the back. You know, it's like, it's like when we all line up, we all line up for a photo. I'm tall. I'm not going to hop in the front of, you know, I'm, I'm used to getting in the back when it's time to take the photo. Mm -hmm. So... So maybe, you know, when you get together with musicians, like you said, you get in that group, then you find your place. Hey, maybe I don't want to play music at all. I want to drive the van. That's what I want to do. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll collect the money at the gig and, and, and book the hotels and drive the van for you guys. I like doing that. You know, maybe, maybe like there's a role for everybody, but yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a, that's, that's a good thing. And, and playing in pubs, like you said, now, you know, they, they could try to, they could try to do whatever they want with the internet, but the internet is not the end all of how to make it now. I guess that's that's the big takeaway from this, right? That that you could still make it by going and playing a pub, you know, like those used to be my favorite gigs where nobody even knew where who was playing. You're just pulling them in by the way you sound. It's like, hey, I like this. I'll pay my ten dollars and go. And then I know if I'm playing drums and somebody walked in on the strength of how it sounded right there and i oh, oh who's on stage oh my god did you hear so and so's there oh no it's it's like how they, they just like like the sound right there and they're coming in and dancing oh that's the best feeling in the world that means that what i'm doing right there is making somebody dance mm -hmm. and that's oh that's the best feeling in the world well you kind of gave like a one piece of advice you would like to give to people in this industry um, we also like to ask for three words that you would use to describe your career path so far. And it can be like a three word phrase, or it could just be three individual words. Keep your ears open. Well, that's four words. It's okay. We'll go with four. Okay. You can have four words. Yeah, or keep your ears open. Do. I'm trying to do it without, without it sounds like I'm giving anybody advice. Nobody wants to have, nobody wants any advice, man. That's the yes, thing. they do. That's, yeah. that's the purpose. <laughs> no, they want to hear a story. Like, that's why, you know, it's at least you got me telling a story. Well, here's how it happened for me. Mm -hmm. You know, here's what I did. That's all I could tell you is, 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 you know, but it was a different time. But that's the one similarity is that, yes, you can get a group of people together and go play a pub. You can do that. You can, absolutely. Say thank you very much. You've been 
You've been amazing. We've uh, really loved having you on. Thanks. No, I... This was one of the best interviews I've ever done. You guys have asked really great questions. And I, I mean, I, I can't, I can't tell you how many stupid interviews I've just like, you know, it's like, and then that made, you know what it was like, it made me realize they didn't really care about interviewing me. They wanted to hear mm -hmm. about John Mayer or somebody like that. Right. You know, like, they're like, come on, you don't really care about me. I could be me or the next guy, but you guys somehow care about what I have to say. And that, 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 that means a lot. Yeah, no, and we appreciate you coming on a podcast where we said we've interviewed mainly actors or directors. And so I appreciate this because I think it gave me insight of similarities, but also very vastly different in the two industries. Um, and your quote about just kind of getting over yourself, like just how nervous you talked about being before you're like live. I think there is a lot of similarities with that too, that I think anybody can pull for. So yeah, because you know, yeah, well, you know, you know, when you go for a job, they, the the people, are, you know, are always looking for the person that makes them feel relaxed that they don't even care. Like I don't even care if I get this job, and then you then you'll get the job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, thank you again, Jay. We greatly appreciate it. Right on, you guys. Awesome. awesome. Thank, thank you so much. much. I, 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 you guys could interview me anytime. Oh, awesome. thank you.